Hi, my name is Bill Cumby. I'm a teacher at uh, First Church of Ministries in Newport News, Virginia. And we're going through the book of Genesis, and we're now in chapter 3. And we are going to be covering um, the sadness of it all, the fall. Let's open in prayer. Lord, we uh, thank you for your love to us. We thank you for the wonderful world you created for us. We thank you for your great love and care for us and um, the tragedy of the fall uh, of our disobedience that we repeat uh, in our own lives daily, um, calling out to you to, to deliver us from ourselves and our sin. And Lord, I, I pray that as we study the origins of this, that it might resonate in us that we indeed have the same problems that they had and that uh, the solution is, is you, um, that you have to come into our lives and change us. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. So um, we're in chapter 3, and this is the, the splash screen that, again, talks about being created in the image of God. So, again, doing the setting overall in, chat, in Genesis is, is we've really got to see that the Israelites... Um, at that time, count at Mount Sinai, receiving the law, the Pentateuch from Moses, and then throughout history. This, this is the, first, the, the beginning of the first book to help them understand who they are. They're slaves that have been in Egypt 430 years that have now escaped, going back to a land that their forefathers were ancestors in. And the answers of how did the world begin are being answered in chapter 1. And... Uh, what about all the gods in Egypt? Well, the, the answer is in chapter 1. They're not, they're, they're not real gods. There is only one real god, and that's being answered. And how are we going to live? Well, that's being answered here, too. In chapter 2, we see God sort of focus in on he created the whole world. He created man and woman. He put them in the garden to dwell. And then in chapter 2, we see, so we get the six days of, uh, we say six days of creation, but probably instantaneous creation and six days God pictured as furnishing the world uh, and the universe w appropriately and then a rest of Sabbath uh, reflection and then mankind put in the garden mankind made in the image of God to rule over the animals of the, uh, of the field uh, and then created in the image of God so the, what they're being set up for I, it, this is truly a fairy tale in the in the uh, in the, in the uh, sense of uh, it's such a wonderful promising start okay I, I this is not not a fairy tale in the sense that it's not true because I do think this is a true historical account of this I think when when the, if we ever get into the great uh, great eternity and there's a huge movie screen and we see the movie we'll say that yeah that's that's it it's they line up okay um, not sure exactly how that's going to work out in eternity but we'll see um, we get the um, completion uh, of uh, of man's creation and and so I I say that because man's creation the creation of man is uh, male and female is not revealed into chapter 2 all it says is that he created mankind male and female he created them and it takes special case because again what it's trying to help us understand is we are a community we are male and female it's not man is not mankind and, and it's male and female are mankind so so he creates man, but, but on the other hand, man is created first and woman is created from his side to be a helpmate. And so there's a responsibility and division of, of, of uh, responsibilities here. And it's not one being inferior to the other. Again, this is the discussion we have of, of, um, uh, of well, is, is there equality? Then why are roles inferior? And there's not, there are different roles, okay? Um, just the son is equal to the father the father superintends creation the son superintended redemption through the death and the Holy Spirit superintends the life of the Christian living in the Christian to help them live a, a good uh, the, the life that got uh, pleasing to God and in union with God and so there's, there's an equality here and yet it, it's hard not to think about different roles without thinking of um, diminished responsibilities or diminished worth and that, 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 that and that's something we need to be careful about that's that's not implied in scripture uh, and it's uh, it's easy for us um, it's easy for us to impress on scripture what we want to see on things so uh, we, we're gonna um, we have again this from chapter 2 in chapter 3 things come there's a problem here 
Now the serpent, remember we talked about, so again going back on this, so uh, God created uh, man um, and uh, mankind, as man and woman, and put them in the garden and the man named the animals and we said last time there were three types of animals. We said the, uh, there were the wild animals, there were the domesticated animals, and there were the creepy crawly things. And so here it talks about the serpent was more crafty or beautiful or uh, uh, had more guile um, than any of the wild animals the Lord God had created. He was the top of the food chain. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? Now, we, th there's all kinds of questions that are going to come up here that we don't have the answer for. And the first question is, did, did all the animals speak in those days? It, was it just the serpent? Or was, is this the devil going into the serpent to try to tempt them? And that's what it's been held traditionally. It's been the traditional view. Still doesn't answer the question whether animals could talk or not. Um, but every indication we get afterwards is the animals are dumb. They don't, they don't talk, um, unless you're in Narnia where they do talk, and I do hope that happens. Um, uh, but, but right now they don't. And the serpent comes to the woman. She doesn't seem to notice the problem here, that the, that she's, the serpent is talking to her. He says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, this is the, the, the woman should have said, uh, you see the response here. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, so, so there's some stuff being added here, a couple things here. The mandate about not eating of the fruit was given to man before woman was created. So the question is, was it accurately communicated to the woman, number one? Did God say that afterwards? Did she hear that directly? But she's not giving the full information because there is no prohibition against touching it. Now, not might have been a smart thing, but the prohibition was about eating it, okay? And also, this, the devil is saying, you can't eat from any of the trees. She should have come back and said, no, we can eat from all the, the trees are all good. We can eat from all the trees and it's all good food. There's just one off limits, okay? There's just one. But the, the, all of a sudden, the, the focus get, seems to get, you know, that's how it is. We, we work by exceptions, okay? If, if, if you're told to do nine, eight, ten things and you don't want to do one of them, that's one that's going to stick in your craw. That's the one that, the, all of a sudden there's this focus here. Um, it's in the middle of the garden. We might not touch it or we will die. And now the serpent comes in and says, you will certainly not die. You're not going to die. For God knows that when you eat from, from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Here is the classic issue. She doesn't know the serpent. She does know God. Uh, so apparently God comes and walks with them. So it's not even a question of that she can't see God because at that time God was, would come and assume a form that he would walk and talk with them. Um, so she has no reason to believe the serpent. There's nothing in there to believe the serpent. Okay? There's no reason for her to even doubt God on this. Um, there's, there's no question. You know, Adam, I'm sure, would recount it that she had been formed from his, you know, the, the thing, and, and this, but again, this, she listens to him. This is a question that, you know what? We always sort of listen to what we want to hear, okay? It's, that's, a, that's a pretty constant problem. So, so it, it, don't judge her too harshly. She's human, like we're human, and we like to hear what we like to hear. And here, he's, he's saying, he's telling us to not trust God, which, which should have set off the warning flags, but then he trolls the bait but you'll know, there's, you'll know more, okay? You'll grow up, you'll, you'll be something more. Now, if she doesn't know good from evil, she doesn't even know what she's being promised. Okay, it's just, it's not there. I mean, so you'll know good from evil. What is good and evil? There's a test here, okay? So, so the truth is, if she had resisted, if Eve had resisted, if Adam had resisted, they would have known good from evil, but they would have known it from above because they resisted the evil. But because of what happened, we now know good and evil from below in bondage to the evilness. And so there was a test here, and the test itself was not wrong. 
the, what the problem was is the response to the test. And, and God, I have to say, God set us up for success, okay? He put us in a wonderful, he gave us everything, everything. Just don't eat that one tree. And, 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 and here comes the serpent that you don't know from, we like to say Adam's house cat. You don't know him from that. And all of a sudden he's, he's, he's saying these things that were, that's being listened to, okay? Uh, and it's like, when the woman's, so the woman, now she looks, she, she must be around there in the middle of the garden. So the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food. Now I don't know how you can see that it was good for food unless you maybe saw other animals eating. I don't know. I don't think that was that though, because I think that was a tree reserved period for God. Okay? But she saw that it was good for food and certainly pleasing to the eye. You could certainly see that. And also desirable for gaining wisdom, which she doesn't know what it is. She does not know what wisdom is, but she saw it's desirable for gaining wisdom because she listened to somebody else, not to God. Um, she took some of it and ate it. Now, it's interesting. She just said that if you touch it, you'll die. So she, she, there's something not there's something not adding up here in, in this. And, and again, I think we choose to sin when we don't see the world the way that God made it. Okay? We choose to sin when we listen to someone else or somebody else, something else, like the devil. Sometimes it's our own desires that tell us something different, and that's what we want. The heart wants what it wants. Um, And it's hard to be different than that because God created us as independent moral agents with a will. And doing that implies the ability to make a contrary choice. And so um, it's, it's, that's part of the baggage we have to achieve moral independence is a dis that, that we can make a wrong decision too. And God lets us do that. Fortunately, God has a rescue plan for us too, but it, it has to be a real decision. So she could have resisted him, but she didn't. And, um, and Adam could have resisted, but he did it. And people say, oh, I don't believe original sin passed on and stuff like that. Fine, you don't have to believe in original sin because there's something you did that you shouldn't have done. And so sometime in your life, even if you think you're the more, most morally righteous person in the world, there's stuff you've done that is wrong. You, it's universally acknowledged. So whether you don't want the responsibility of, well, I got that from Adam and Eve, it's not my responsibility. Well, you, you were in your own record on things too. So there's a responsibility there. So a woman took it and ate it, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now, there's a bit ambiguity here. Was he there in the garden, or was he right there next to her present? I think I, argue, I would argue on the side that he was probably right there. And the question is, what was he doing when this conversation was going on? And the answer is, we don't know. This is, this is the, 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 we don't have, the, that's why it pays to think about what's going on here. If we did know, would it make a difference? Think about that. We'll talk about that maybe a little next week, um, the next lesson. So. Uh, the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made covering for themselves. And again, it's not figs there, it's just fruit. It, it, it was a fruit of a tree, so I think, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not the word figs there. Well, sorry about the digressions. Um, but the both, the eyes, their eyes were open. Now, this is the thing. The, and Paul picks this up, and I may pick it up uh, if we take an extended tour through Genesis 3. Um, but the man was the responsible party in this thing. So Eve was deceived, okay, it said, and she took it and ate it. But man also had that decision to make. The question comes up is, well, what if she had done that and man hadn't? And the answer is, again, we don't know because they were one. And by nature, what one does the other, they were a community at that point. Now that community got run asunder. Okay, and we're going to talk about that, but, but there was a oneness there. And so there should have been an intervention when, if the man was there, there should have been an intervention of the man saying, whoa, 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 hey, let's talk about this before you do this. But it didn't happen that way. And, and um, you sort of wonder, was a man 
see what happens and you know what what was going on here I'm not sure why the ambiguity is there I'm not sure why the unknown is there except that in a sense this becomes every man's problem okay uh, we, later it comes up with uh, Cain and Abel when God asks where Abel is and Cain says am I my brother's keeper and the implied answer that, that God is yes you are your brother's keeper and so um, um, it's a difficult passage but this is what happens they both eat the tree from the tree and their eyes were opened and they found they were naked it's so anticlimactic and their eyes were opened and they didn't know good from evil he doesn't say that they did okay because the serpent, serpent the serpent does what a lot of people do he took the data and he twisted it so he's right they did indeed know good from evil okay and they indeed did not die immediately although spiritually they died that, mo that moment but physically they, so was the serpent lying I mean, they didn't die right away, and they didn't know good from evil because they did evil. So was he? So, but we'll see what God has to say about that in this next section. Um, but this is the point: the eyes were opened, and they realized they were naked. And people say, "Oh, this is about the taboo about uh, nakedness that, that normally mankind doesn't." You know, there's this taboo against people being naked, and this story. This is a story made up to help us understand why people feel it's shameful to be naked. And I'm thinking, no, that's not the point at all. Let me tell you what the point is. This. Before when they were naked, they were naked and they had nothing to hide, nothing to be ashamed about. But when they ate from that tree, all of a sudden they had sinned and they had something to hide. And they couldn't hide themselves spiritually. But they knew they had to hide. And so they made for themselves coverings and they hid from God. I mean, how do I know that's true? But they hid from God too. It wasn't just, so, so what happens is um, when something happens in our life spiritually, it spills over into the physical. And same with the physical to the spiritual. You can be, you, I tell you, you go ahead and run yourself on two hours of sleep a night for a couple weeks and you'll be in the loony bin, okay? And that's an emotional mindset thing, but it's because of physical deprivation, okay? There's, there's a, a consequence both ways. We are, uh, we are a spirit, uh, soul, nex body nexus, okay? Our, what happens to us physically affects us spiritually. What happens to us spiritually affects us physically, and this is the great example of that. So, and this is, by the way, is also why pornography is so um, seductive, because you have someone naked saying, I accept you as you are. I'm not covered up. I'm in, and we're all, the, the, we're saps. We, we buy it. We know it's not true, but we buy it. And so there's this seduction here that goes on. And, and, and the, the crass case is pornography, but it happens all the time. When someone butters you up or praises you or does something else and tries to, tries to ignore the sin and you're, ignore what's high enough and saying, I accept you as you are, then that's where we really find that we want to belong. And that's why many people join cults and other things. Now, the body of Christ, the church, should be a love and accepting body and because we accept others because the sins have been covered in Christ. We don't do that well, okay? Um, I'm not sure we do it worse than the world, but we don't do it much better either. I mean, it's just, it, it is what it is. We tend to want to be with our friends and we tend to associate with them and to ignore other people that we don't know and not like people that are different from us, just like other people do. I mean, that's, it's the world, it's not right, it's wrong, but that's what happens. But here what's happening is they're scared now. They have something to hide. And let's see what God has to say on this. So here we get the blame game, okay? Um, and the blame game is this. So the man and the wife heard the sound of the Lord God as Oh, by the way, uh, going back here, just take a look at this. The serpent uh, was, it, it uses the word Elohim. Did God really say, okay? But the, the narrative continues with the Lord God, but the devil's just using God. He's using the generic name. So the, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as they were walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from God, the Lord God, among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. So he calls to the man. The man says, I was afraid, 
so I was naked, so I hid. And God says, I told you you were naked. Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? Now, this is a typical parent question, isn't it? Have, have you, Johnny, did you, did you take that chocolate milk that you know, I told you not to have? I mean, this is, this is God's, does he know? Oh yeah, God knows. I mean, God understands. He, he knew even before, he, even before Adam said he hid, but he's trying to elicit some information here. Did you eat from the, the tree I commanded you? So the man says, the woman, so he, now it's the woman's fault. The woman you put here with me, now it's God's fault. The woman you gave me, the, the woman you gave me did this to me. So now he's blaming God. You know, the, the woman you put here with me, like, you put, what do you mean you put here with me? You, you created out of this. All of a sudden it's like, I just saw her. I don't, I don't know. I, I, you know, have you eaten from the tree? Uh, you know, she, she gave me some fruit. I ate it. I, like, what was I supposed to do? If she gave it to me, I ate it. This is the woman you put with me, right? how quickly we want to shift the blame on this. So, so the Lord says to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman says, the devil made me do it. You know, you know the, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. So the blame game is going on here. What this, to this, to this, you know. It wasn't me. I, that woman you gave me, she gave me. And then, oh, it wasn't me. It was the serpent and he deceived me and I did it. As a wise parent, God goes and deals with each in his turn. But the point here is that blame has become endemic very quickly. Okay, um, when we're caught, our natural response is to lie. Uh, and I would say, you, you get into all kinds of word conundrums. It's, that's not that's not the wrong response, but it is the wrong response. But it's the natural response for us to lie to get out of trouble. You know, I, I have a friend who's who's been a spiritual mentor to me, and he said, I, I love his observation. No one has to teach a kid how to lie. You might have to help them to walk. You have to teach them how to read. You have to do that. No one has to teach a kid how to lie. It comes natural to us. Okay? So did you eat that? Yeah. I. One of my kids, so I won't actually go into names, it was, it was once they were playing with Play-Doh, and I said, are you, are you playing with Play-Doh? In their mouth, you know, and like, like, what makes you think I have Play-Doh? Didn't say anything, but it's, that's our nature, right? We just, I, there's nothing wrong, I, I'm not even sure I've forbidden her to, you know, well, now I'm down to two out of the four, uh, <laughs> to, to do that, and, but the, uh, it's just natural to us. So, you know, I remember once there was a king cake cutting up, and I hated king cake. And uh, and this is this um, young woman that uh, I was having difficulties in relationships in the office had set up the king cake, so I got the the little baby that's in the king cake, and I didn't eat the king cake. And she said, "Did you eat the king cake?" And I said, "Yeah." And then I said, "Actually, I didn't." And, and the, the, there was in there was a reconciliation thing, and I said, like, "But it's our nature. It's our nature to say, no, I can't do it.'" No. The officer comes in, do you know how fast you were going? You know exactly how fast you're going. You, Gee, officer, I don't really remember. I, it's a little fuzzy, you know. Um, and it, it's our nature, okay? We, 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 we lie about things now. And um, we're going to come to all that, but let's talk about what God has to say here. So this is really small print, but I want it all in one place, okay? Because he, did, he deals with them in order. He deals to the serpent. So the Lord God says to the serpent, because you have done this, okay, and I want you to note this, there's two curses here. One is curse of the serpent, and the other is curse on the land. Mankind, man and woman, are not cursed. They're punished, but not cursed. We say it's part of the curse. Well, it may be part of the curse, but man and, man, uh, woman, man and woman were not cursed, okay? Uh, they were punished, and there's a big difference in that. But God says, cursed are you above all livestock and all the wild animals. So all of a sudden, the top two categories, he's been knocked out of the top of the wild animals. He's not even with the domestic animals. You will crawl on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, some people say, this is, this is a story in here because people are afraid of snakes and this tells why snakes crawl on the ground don't have feet and stuff like that. And I think, okay, if that's what you want to say, I mean, you don't, you're not really looking at the text here. The text here is a, a, an animal greatly endowed, gifted in many ways, 
is being cursed into the lowest category here. And it, uh, you know, it makes sense. I mean, historically it makes sense. I mean, you look, people say there was a time when snakes had legs, you know. Um, uh, there's the, jo the sockets are there, but they don't now. And you say, well, it evolved that way. I say it was cursed. God cursed them, and they, they crawl on the ground. So there's a curse now to the, the serpent. That, by the way, is a curse not just to the serpent, but to the devil and to anyone who would twist and mislead. Okay? So the, in the court of God, if the devil wanted to argue, he'd say, I never lied. I, I, I told them that they, sure, they wouldn't die. They're alive, right? You let them live. Um, you know, and they do no good for me. I didn't lie. Why are you punishing me? But you know what? God is God. God does what he wants to do. You can say all you want. I, I followed the rules. I mean, if you, if you lied, you lie. I mean, he twisted the law here, and God's very, very clear. You, you lead someone to temptation and cause them to fall, you're responsible for that. There is a penalty for that. There's a curse for that. Not just a penalty, but a curse. Uh, and that's why he says, you know, Jesus says about the little ones, if anyone causes one of these little ones to go astray, it'd be better for him to have a great millstone hung around his neck and thrown into the sea than to cause one of these young ones to fall. Because leading people astray is the worst of the worst. Okay? It's worse than sinning yourself to cause other people. I think, I think that's what this is saying. Um, some theologians may disagree with me, but I think that's what it's saying. To mislead someone, to cause someone else to lose their soul because you lied to them is, is a much worse thing than your own denial. Um, and to the woman, he said, I think it's to the woman, he says, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe, and with painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, he will rule over you. Now, this is the interesting thing. So man was left to take care of the garden. His tendency was to work it. Woman's two things was to help man, to co-labor with him in the garden, to have uh, to do things with them, but also to have children, okay? That was the other thing. So one, only a woman can do that. Man makes a small contribution, but it's the woman that does it, okay? The punishment is in the areas of responsibility. So the areas of responsibility here is uh, childbirth and, and uh, cooperation with your husband. And so now, instead of uh, childbirth being natural. Some people have said that humans, that babies are much more formed than they are, they were. They have to be that way to survive all the disease and other stuff that's outside the womb. And so the head is much larger and it's hard to go through. And maybe so. I don't know if that's what happened then. But I do know this. That they said there was, there was, shouldn't have been pain before in childbirth. And now there is. Okay. There's pain in the area of responsibility. There's a punishment that it, it is, uh, and that's why I say, is, it, is this the curse? Is it punishment fitting the crime, so to speak? Or is it just the natural outworking of sins? I don't know. So when the world is fallen and stuff, the natural outworking is that women now has a child, carry a child much longer, and there's pain there. I don't know that. But I do know this. The punishment is in the area of responsibility. And that's her area of responsibility. The other area is cooperation with man. And instead of now a cooperation, a cooperative thing, there's now going to be enmi there's going to be a striving for superiority here, and and we we certainly see that we see that we see that in mankind. Period. Okay, so there's a general thing where everyone wants to be better than others. We might not say it, and we might say, "Nah, it's not true." But we, if, if nothing else, we want to be better so we have an easier life or we enjoy ourselves more, something like that. We we there's there's a competition in here. And now there's a competition with husband and wife. And um, the marriage is supposed to be a real, an idea where you enjoy one another and you love one another and you have children and it's, things are great. Sin has changed all that. And you think, hey, you choose anyone you want and, get, you know, and you get married. And all you have to do, you, your best friend, and you can live with them forever. And, and, and half of all marriages end in divorce. And why is this? It's because of sin. It's because there's a striving in here. Now, it might not be this particular, the, the rule of equality and stuff like this. But I tell you this, there always had to be someone that could make a decision. Okay? There had to be an ultimate source of thing. But really, if, you're, if, if, if that becomes a problem, there's a problem with the marriage because the marriage... In, in relationships should be based on equality anyway. And really, 
the decision should devolve to the person who has responsibility in the area. If, 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 I'm, doing work, if I'm doing work in the business end of my company and, and I'm the top business person, then I make the business decisions. But if I'm, if I'm the technical person, I'm the chief technical, I make the technical decisions. Yeah, there might be a boss up there, but there's a CFO and a CTO, chief technology officer and a chief financial officer, and they're at the top of the food chain. And the CFO shouldn't be messing with the CTO, and the CTO shouldn't be messing with the CFO in those areas of responsibility. Same thing in a marriage, okay? There should be joint stuff. Now, um, knowledge is not always applied, okay? I was talking with Jose, sitting behind the camera now, giving me good feedback. Um, they just before this, that uh, uh, I have problems, as, as lots of people do, with, um, but maybe my problem is worse than most with sometimes speeding. I haven't got a speeding ticket in a long time, but I, I did get some speeding tickets. And once I got the speeding ticket, and um, I had to go through a class, and I went through this class, a video class, I could listen, I could put it on, and I could actually go and do my other work while I was doing it, because I, I, I knew this stuff, okay? And then I went to this internet cafe where there was a proctor, and I had to take the test. It was a half an hour test, I don't know, 30, 40 questions in multiple choice. I finished in five minutes, I got 95, and the guy said, like, wow, that's amazing. And I said, you know, it never was a knowledge problem, okay? My problem was speeding. It might have been the punishment to make me have to go through all this, but it was never a knowledge problem. It was my heart problem, it was my foot problem. It was me wanting to do things my way problem. It wasn't an issue. So I know this stuff about marriage, and I, you know, but it's, and we, we know it, but doing it sometimes is hard, okay? That's what I'm saying. So, so I don't want you to look at it and say, oh, he, he understands this. Everyone knows that things must be really fine all the time. No, they're not. I'm, I, the problem is I come from the root of Adam, and I do the same things. Yeah. So, um, and I struggle with that. I struggle a lot with that. And I, I want us to understand that we've got to be able to share those things because we've got to be able to encourage one another to change in those areas too. So to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife, which you should have, but because you listened to your wife with bad advice, and ate the fruit of the tree, which I commanded you must not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you, because you had dominion, but now the ground is cursed. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. So the question comes up naturally to me is, that's, is this where mosquitoes came from? Okay, yeah, I mean, what was happening here? Because mosquitoes, you know, they, I don't know that they were there before. If they did, they didn't hurt us like they do now. Um, it will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat the food until you return to the ground. Since you were taken from it, for dust you are, and dust you will return. So. The punishment in mankind comes in the areas of, of um, cooperation, childbearing, and then uh, our work that was supposed to be a joy but is now hard. And yet there's relief from all that too. This is still a very enjoyable world. This is still a very fruitful world. People still have children. Um, real marriages still work, you know, and stuff like that. Now none of them, none of the stuff works as well as it should. And this is the reason why. So, so any good explanation of the world has to explain the world uh, as it is in, in reality, which this does. It doesn't have to talk about the way it could have been or was or should have been, but it's nice to know that. So, so what the Israelites are seeing is that the world was, they're, they're wondering why, is it, why were we slaves in Egypt for 380 years? Why are we going through this desert and why, why is because the world's been, things have happened in the world that have, in, in, that, that have not just affected mankind, but affected the world. There's a desert, the desertification, and the, you know, the animals, the mosquitoes I was joking about, and other stuff, the, the snakes and stuff, are a result of the fall. They, 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 were, they might have been there in different forms ahead of time, yet something happened and twisted creation. And so, um, you know, I have no idea what it was like except that it was a really wonderful place and we're going to a place that's going to be equally wonderful but right now we're sort of stuck in the middle here and uh and and god's trying to help us understand that in this situation so we're going to circle back to this next time i i want to cover this um 
and push through just because, uh, because of some timing things. Jose and I aren't going to be able to talk about this for a while. It's not as finished as I would like it to be, but, but it's essential, and so we will be circling back. I did want to get it out there for people to be thinking about because um, this is where our problems are. Now, he's going to go, and there is a solution. The solution is that God himself paid the price. There was a disobedience, and we did die spiritually. That day, we did die. Like the instant we ate that fruit, um, and when I say we, I mean we, we, we are inheritors of that sin, okay? Um, and, and the reason I say that is because it says there was a first Adam, and we all died in the first Adam. Yeah, we live out that death. We each individually sin and stuff like that, but we lived out that death. The new Adam, it says in Romans, is Jesus Christ. And when, when he came and died for us, we have the possibility of being grafted into that family. And so just as Adam ate the fruit and all mankind died, so with Jesus Christ, the price was paid. And accepting Christ into our lives as Lord and Savior pays that price, and we are grafted into a new family. And we're giving a new family. We have new family members. We can't always get along with them, but we didn't always get along with the old ones either. You've got to be honest about things here. So um, we get the Holy Spirit too, and the Holy Spirit changes our lives. Now, we can talk about that. We talked about some of that in Ephesians. The point of it is, is that God now gives us a deposit into eternity and can change us. And, and the bottom line on this, and this is a very personal thing for me, is um, I'm 62 years old now. I was talking with uh, Jose earlier, and I was talking with my cousin, who's 60 years old, and I thought, you know, I should have learned this stuff about myself a long time before I'm 62. I'm seeing stuff in myself that I really don't like, okay? And I've been a believer now for 40 years. So the question I have to ask myself is this. Number one, I know there's always going to be a lot, but is there something I'm doing to block the Holy Spirit from changing me? Because that is the Holy Spirit's function, is to comfort and encourage me, but also to give me the power to change. So I ask that question to you, too. Um, I, I, why am I the way I am? Because God does give us strength and power to change that. He tells us a story, but he doesn't tell us a story to leave us in despair. He tells us a story to lift us out into something different. There is a wonderful life waiting for us. I have to say, the stuff I'm dealing with now, uh, some, it's, it's all self-inflicted, okay, pretty much also. Sometimes, but sometimes the nature of the world inflicts things on you. Like, there are babies born that never did anything wrong, that are deformed, that have birth defects and stuff like that, that the world as a whole does. But, but and, and you really ask the question, why then? I mean, I'm just getting what I deserve. But the, the point of this is, is... But in Christ, there's a forgiveness, and there's a remaking of our lives. And so this is not just a funny, fun story. This is not just a story that tells us, um, gives us, oh, that's why I sin. It's, 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 a, it's a sad story. It's a story that's more, I mean, right afterwards, Eve has Cain and Abel. And one, the first person born, the first person born becomes a murderer of their brother. The world is terribly out of control. There's only one hope. The hope is Christ, okay? And, and um, we can't do it on our own. So God came and did it for us. And we're going to be looking at that next week, too, because God says, I will send someone. In fact, we see it here, uh, just at this end, 15, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. The devil struck his heel on Calvary where Christ was crucified. There was, the death blow was there, and yet Jesus crushed the head of the serpent. There is victory there. And so I don't want to end this on, on the punishment thing, but on the fact that there is redemption, that God has a wonderful plan for our lives. He had a wonderful plan. It was, it was um, changed because God gave us independent, free moral will. And there is now going to be a redemption of that. But we have free, independent moral will. It is a decision we have to make. So C.S. Lewis wrote a great, and I'll close with this, C.S. Lewis wrote a great uh, little um, uh, parable called the, the Great Divorce, where there's actually a bus that, that goes from hell to heaven. And it, it has a great picture of hell. And it talks to heaven, and these come up here. And um, I... I, I the point of it is, uh, in this is, there's actually a choice afterwards on this, okay? And that's, again, it's a parable, because we're not given 
any indication there's a second choice and we get to make a second choice. But the point of it is, is that most, if not all, I don't want to give away the thunder of the story, choose to get back at that bus and go back to hell because they don't want to be in heaven. Because they don't want someone ru ruling over them. And there is a ruling over in heaven that there is not in hell. It's every man for himself in hell. And some people will choose that over that. But for those that bow their knees to God and say, God, I need you and I want you, there's an eternity plan for us. It's wonderful beyond compare coming out of this worst thing that ever happened here. So let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the time we have. We thank you for your word. I thank you that uh, you work through fallen instruments. If if I would have to earn a, a more righteousness, the ability to really teach this, I couldn't do it because I don't have it in me uh, except through you and except through your blood and except through your spirit which dwells in me. Lord, I pray you help us live lives pleasing to you. I pray that you help your spirit give free reign in our life, that we would give free reign in our lives to the spirit to change us. And we thank you for the gift you've given us in your life and uh, death and, and resurrection and we thank you for the gifts you give us through the Holy Spirit and we thank you in your name Jesus.